Good morning. I'm very thankful to be here with you and to have the opportunity as a member of this body to share something of my mind to hopefully encourage and build you up this morning. In Exodus chapter 32, a regrettable incident occurs. Regrettable incident might be what a politician would call it. But what actually happened was some pretty, pretty ridiculous idolatry. Uh, Moses is on top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, which he is going to bring back down to the Israelites. And the mountain itself is noteworthy. It appears like it's on fire. The earth is shaking. There's thunder and lightning. It's a very impressive sight. So that those who are sitting around the mountain cannot help and, and cannot escape the fact that they are sitting at the mountain of God, whose presence is on top of the mountain. They are right there in his shadow. And while Moses is up there speaking to God, as they have asked Moses to do, because they couldn't stand to hear his voice, they decide it is in their best interest to melt down their gold and fashion it into a calf and bow down and worship it. Obviously, Moses and God have some problems with this. They don't receive it very well. Moses, in his anger, throws down the Ten Commandments and shatters them. And God is not pleased either. And that's where we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you along the way. Mistakes were made in chapter 32, is the way that we would often say it today. Looking back, mistakes were made. Yeah, mistakes were made. Big mistakes were made. But God has made promises, and he's going to keep those promises. It's not on the basis of the Israelites' faithfulness. It's not on the basis of their perfection or their altogether attractiveness as a group of people. It's because God made promises. God fulfills his promises because of who he is, not because of who we are. God is perfect. His promises are perfect even when we are not. And because God's promises are perfect, God is merciful. God is patient. And both of these things are shown to us clearly in this passage. One thing I find interesting in this in verse 30 i'm sorry chapter 33 verse 1 god says to moses go up from here you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of egypt previously when god talked about the way that the israelites got out of egypt he made it very clear I am the one who brought you out of here with mighty outstretched arm and great judgments and great deliverance and miracles. I am the one who has done it. But because of what's just happened, God is distancing himself from the people. It's almost like Adam when he wanted to hide from the apple that he had eaten in his guilt. He said, the woman that you gave me did this. Well, God is now saying, take the Israelites that you brought out of Egypt. <laughs> it's time to go. God can't even stand to look at them. He doesn't want to be associated with them anymore. Because of the great idolatry which they've committed. Sitting at the mountain of the Lord, they bow down to a calf and say, this is our God. This led us out of Egypt. How repulsive. Truly, truly terrible. And God says, I'm not even going to go up with you. I can't even stand to look at you because you are an obstinate people. And if I were with you for that long, I might just destroy you. God can't stand to be with the people, but he will still fulfill his promises. In verses 4 through 6, 
we read that when the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning, and none of them put on his ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Ornaments is a word which catches my attention because it's not one that I'm sure I would use. Um, certainly not in, in my day-to-day -day, um, vernacular language. I probably wouldn't use this word, but it certainly catches my attention. It describes what they're wearing. And using the word ornaments is a better word than just saying they stripped off their nice clothes. Ornaments are something that are sparkly, they're shiny, they're decorative. They go beyond the purpose of sheer utility, and they look nice. Remember what those ornaments were. In the book of Exodus, when they left the land of Egypt, verse uh, 35 and 36 of chapter 12, they took with them fine jewelry and clothing that they had plundered from the Egyptians. I believe it was Men's Warehouse who had a campaign who said, if you look good, you'll feel good. And I get the feeling that that's a little bit of what's happening here. For the last 400 years, the Egyptians have been wearing rags while they've been oppressed and enslaved in the land of Egypt. Uh, they've not been looking good. But now that they're on the way out of Egypt, having stood behind the arm of God, who in wonderful display has shown his power and miraculous intervention, the Israelites got to sit back and say, yeah, he's on our team. And then when they left, they got to take all of the Egyptians' nice, fine clothes and jewelry and wear it for themselves. And I just get the feeling that they are starting to feel themselves. They're starting to feel other than themselves. They're wearing different clothing that looks really nice. They're wearing jewelry. Their adornment is external and fine. And I get the feeling that they are forgotten who they are. That they are still that nation of slaves whom the Lord delivered from the hand of the Egyptians. They've forgotten who they are, and so God has commanded them to take it all off. As he often does, as it relates to the things, all things Egyptian, God says, leave Egypt back in Egypt. They left Egypt puffed up. It's time to resume their journey humble again, remembering who they were. And it appears, to their credit, that the Israelites do so. That they do take off their ornaments and they go into mourning. And not only did they take them off, but it says in verse 6 that from Mount Horeb onward, they didn't go back to wearing those nice things, those clothes and jewelry anymore. Because it wasn't who they were and they needed to remember that. Starting off their new journey with humility is a good thing the right thing for them to do, especially having gone through this, this terrible embarrassment. It's, it's an atrocious thing. It's, it's idolatrous and insulting to God. But looking back in hindsight, I would think that the Israelites, anytime this was mentioned, would feel great shame and embarrassment to think, how could we have conducted ourselves? How could we have done something like this there of all places in the presence of God how could we have done something so foolish, just outright dumb? I would think they would have been embarrassed by it. And so in their shame, they dress accordingly. They become humble. And it appears to be a sign of genuine repentance, which is a good way for them to move forward. I'd like to now read verses 7 through 23, the rest of this passage rest of this chapter, and I see three great prayers. In a passage in which we, we read a dialogue between man and God. And it's encouraging. It, it strikes you when you read passages like this because sometimes God feels distant to us. That he's, he's far away. Uh, he is on heaven and we are on earth. Well, here God speaks with man. And man asks questions, and God gives answers. And man makes requests, and God grants requests. It's direct conversation, the way that we want to talk directly with God. And one day we'll. 
But let's read this passage and starting in verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent that all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak to Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. And thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. And then Moses said to the people, see, you say, I'm sorry, Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people. But you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name. And you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, that I might find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us, so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all other people who are on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this saying of which you've spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. And then Moses said, I pray, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about that while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away. And you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. A great scene that we see here. More of which we had previously seen is seen here now as well. Verse 7, Moses used to take his tamp, his camp, camp slash tent. He used to take his tent and he would pitch it outside of the camp a good distance. I like this little detail because it just goes to show that God's not going to be in the middle of them right now. Remember, we we're talking in the book of Numbers about the way the camp was organized. All of the tribes, 12 tribes, with the exception of Levites, on the outside, scattered about, structured like bricks, insulating the tabernacle in the middle of the camp so that one, no one was any further or any closer from the tabernacle than anybody else. Everyone was close, as close could be, to the tabernacle, which was in their center. They were the insulation of the tabernacle. Well, now the tent of meeting that Moses and God are going to speak at is outside the camp. God and Moses are going to talk, but it's not going to be within earshot of those people that Moses has taken out of the land of Egypt. But... The Israelites have an appropriate response here. They recognize that God is still speaking with man. And so they would go outside of their tents and it says they would gaze upon Moses. They would watch Moses go to the tent of meeting, recognizing the significance of that meeting. Moses was their delegate. They asked Moses, go up and speak to God for us. Well, there he is. He's going up and speaking to God for them, but God is speaking too. And they recognize the importance so that when the cloud descends, the people would rise and worship, each at the entrance of his own tent. The Israelites are a little farther from God right now in their relationship than they would like to be. But they're doing what's right. 
They are drawing near to the Lord in spirit. So that hopefully, as the book of James says, he might draw near to them as well. They're watching Moses and they're worshiping the Lord, each from their own tent. And I like this little detail that we see in verse 11 about a little man, a little guy named Joshua, who is going into the tent with Moses. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua would not depart from the tent. Joshua even recognized that this is a significant place. This is a place where God is speaking to man. His presence is here. Wherever God is, I want to be there too. So we see a lot of Joshua's character just in that little blurb. And it will certainly tell us why he's going to be leading the children of Israel after Moses. But then Moses and God are speaking. And three great things, three great separate prayers, I would say, are offered all in this one conversation. And I want to talk about them. I'll, I'll branch them together, bring them together. I'll talk about the first and the third and then the second. The first thing Moses says is, let me know your ways. You have told me to bring up these people, but you yourself have not let me know who is going with you. He says, I pray in verse 13, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways so that I may know you. The third thing that Moses says at the end of this conversation is show me your glory. I find similarity between these two things. God wants to know the Lord. I'm sorry. Moses wants to know the Lord. And so his prayer, which makes sense, is to know the ways of the Lord. Moses asks, show me your glory. And so the way that God will show Moses his glory is, well, let's just read it. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verse 9. He said, I, if now I have found favor in your sight, I pray, let the Lord go along us in our midst. Even though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sins. Let's see. I don't believe this is the place where I want to be. Oh, yeah. No, I want to know a little bit further. I want to verses 4 through 9. Verse 5 through 9. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And so Moses made haste to bow low to the earth and worship. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. To recap, Moses wants to know the Lord, and so he asks, let me know your ways. Moses asks, show me your glory. The Lord answers, you cannot see my face and live, but I will show you my back. I will cover you with my hand and I will walk by. And as he is walking by, he says his name. It's as if a herald is announcing the presence of God. And the way that he does so is, is by saying his character. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. If I were to show you a picture of my grandpa, Howard Eldridge, and I were just to show you what he looked like, uh, you might know his physical characteristics. You might be able to say, well, he looks a little bit like you, which I've been told. And I can see objectively from, pa from, from past pictures, sure, I look a little bit like my grandpa. And it makes sense. I'm 25% my grandpa. 
But if I were to show you that picture, you would know what he looked like. You would be able to see some of his face, facial features. You might be able to see some of the clothes he was wearing. You might make some inferences, but those would only be just that, just be inferences. If I were to take away the picture, and I were to say, Howard Eldridge loved people. He made purposeful relationships with people. He got to know them. He got to know the things that they needed. He was a dedicated servant of God, and he loved his family. If I were to tell you that my grandpa used to stoop down to the ground in the pharmacy, and he would open up his arms and make me run into him, he would scoop me up, and he would sit me down on the pharmacy counter and say, whose boy are you? Then you would know about my relationship with my grandpa. You would know how loving of a man he was, how much he loved his family. You would know that the reason why I'm a pharmacist is because of my grandpa. And he made such a great impression on me that I just wanted to be like him. If I told you those things, you would know a whole lot more about my grandpa than just by looking at his picture. Moses could have just said, show me what you look like, Lord. And if he had, so what? Moses would have known what the Lord looked like. The Lord did come down in the flesh. And many people saw Jesus in the flesh. And all they wanted to see was more magic tricks. They didn't care about what he was saying. Jesus was saying, listen to what I'm saying because of the miracles. Hear my words. Know who I am. To know God is to know his character. And if we want to know who God is, we will read the letter he's written to each of us. We'll read his words. We'll seek his character. And in doing so, we will know the Lord. And the third thing that Moses, well, rather the second thing that he says, but the third thing we'll discuss Moses says a prayer which I think should echo in our hearts today at the beginning of this year and every day going forward. If your presence does not go with us, then do not lead us up from here. Even in my short life, I can remember periods of time where I've felt and said these things. Before I was married, I prayed a lot about marriage. It was something that I wanted. It was a desire that was placed in my heart. And so I prayed fervently to God for it. And then on the day of my wedding, I saw, all right, I'm here. <laughs> this is what I prayed for. But how do you know where you are? How do you know that where you are is what you prayed for? Sometimes even then, when it's right in front of our faces, we still rely on the guidance of the Lord. And so I prayed to Lord. If you don't go with me, then don't lead me down that aisle. <laughs> we should make that prayer in every junction of our lives. If you're not going to go with me, then don't let me go down this road. And yet, if the Lord goes with us, then any road is fine. Any road is all right, is a good thing. Anywhere where God is, is where we should want to be. And it's an important prayer because God, as we've said, has distanced himself from the Israelites at this point. And Moses is reminding God. God has said, take those people who you led out of Egypt. Moses has said, no, you led them out of Egypt. They are your people. In verse 13, consider too, this nation is not just any nation. This nation is your people. And if your presence does not go with us, then we don't want to go. That's the right thing for Moses to say to the Lord. And hopefully it echoed in the hearts of the people as well. The 23rd Psalm comes to my mind when David expresses his peace. He is able to say, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. 
What would David's life be like if you take out the most important part of that passage? God, the presence of God. He's no longer camped beside still waters. His soul is no longer restored. He is no longer guided in paths of righteousness. And he navigates the valley of the shadow of death with fear. Put God back into the equation and his life is completely different. If God goes with us, then we can be at peace. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we can walk without fear for God is with us. And Moses says something else that's important in verse 16. How then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all other people who are on the face of the earth? The presence of God in the lives of his children is their defining characteristic. It's defining for them. It gives them a sense of identity. If we are walking through life and we don't have, as the first saying after our name, child of God, then who are we? What guides our life? What's the compass? How are we making choices? If it isn't as a child of God, I choose this. It gives us an identity. It stabilizes us. It founds our life and gives it internal purpose. And it also makes us known to the rest of the world so that when people see us, they can see that there is something different. This is somebody who's living his life in a way that's different than every other person. It should be obvious when people see that we are living a life as a child of God. It's a defining characteristic for ourselves and for those who see us. So let it be in our lives that we walk as children of God, that our lives are anchored, that they're planted in green pastures by still waters, and that the valley of the shadow of death holds no fear for us, and that our life appears different to those who see us from the outside. If the Lord's presence is with us, then we can go anywhere in peace. Three great prayers to offer this year, that we might know the ways of the Lord, that he might show us his glory, and that his presence might go with us. The Lord has shown his glory. In John chapter 1, we read about the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. God has shown us His glory. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact representation of the glory of God. If we want to see the glory of God, look no further than Jesus, His Son, whom He has sent. You want to go grow closer to God this morning. If you want to be nearer to your creator, you'll find that nearness in Jesus. Who, as the good shepherd, has laid down his life for us voluntarily. Has made salvation known by his sacrifice. And has paid the price for our sins, redeeming us, buying us back. He's given us salvation found in Jesus. And if you're not in Jesus this morning, we invite you to be in Jesus, to become a child of God, to be baptized into Jesus. And if you are a child of God this morning and need help in your walk, if you're finding that this new year has started and continued the struggles of the previous year, and that those struggles are difficult to bear and you need the help, of this congregation here, brothers and sisters in Christ here, if there's any way that we can help you to either pray with you or just to be next to you while you go through this life, to know that you're not alone here on earth or in heaven. If there's any way that we can help you this morning, won't you need, make your needs known as we stand and sing our invitation song.